Uh, John's played quite a significant part in my life, more, rather more significantly than uh, he actually is aware, because um, the, he actually wrote a book with a good friend of mine called Lee Lewis called How to Be a Minister. And um, I don't think you will mind me saying, John, it was not actually in the uh, New York Times top ten bestsellers list. But uh, new ministers are often sent a copy by uh, Lee. Who, uh, Lee's a retired, uh, he's a constituent and friend of mine, but he was, um, I think, probably at DWP with yourself, Lee, but then went on to the Home Office. Very distinguished civil service. But he does have a garage full of these books. <laughs> um, so they wrote alternative um, chapters each. It was one of those books that was, I think it was not quite a Lennon-McCartney, but... Um, it was alternative chapters. Um, and um, I read it very carefully before meeting him. And um, I didn't realize at that stage that most aspects of my job, in fact, would be, um, well, closely watched by Lord Hutton. Nuclear, obviously, is why we're here today and what most people know. But um, amongst John's other things, he's taken a role of chairman of Energy UK. So he now, I think, covers my entire brief. Um, and I, I try and watch myself very carefully and, um, because um, John has got an excellent reputation in Parliament for being, well, a very, an excellent minister and um, a very reasonable and, it's fair to say, moderate person. And most of us are politically in that, roughly speaking, centre ground, however it might seem sometimes on television. But he was um, known as a very... Um, if I may say aggressive public speaker by conservative politicians, that meant that he was doing his job properly from his point of view. So I have to be very careful what I say. And I, um, well, I sort of promised when I came here, I think it was in the first two or three days of my, when I took the job on, that it would be the last time that I actually read a speech out. Because I don't really like reading speeches out. But of course I've learnt now you have to more or less read speeches out when there's an announcement because you have to get things exactly right. So um, bear with me, I shall try and waffle on and not read too much because I've um, some important things to say today. But I would like to make very clear, in the time since I came here in my first um, week, I have developed a huge respect for the nuclear industry, for the way that the, um, well, that the NIA actually conducts itself, the calibre of the people that work for it and represent it very well. I've seen it from the normal, yes, normal meetings that you have with trade bodies, which are part of any ministerial job, but in the detailed representation for the safeguards bill, which Lord Hutton mentioned, and, well, all my, the dealings we've had particularly to do with Euratom and everything else. And it's not an easy job running uh, something like the NIA, because... It, there's always a conflict between the management, to whom a lot of the membership have kind of gone native with government, because they're in and out of Whitehall, as they have to do, and government, who thinks that they're kind of lackeys for um, the, the trade, and you can't get an impartial view. And I know it's a very difficult line for anyone in such a body to take, but I do really appreciate it, and the professionalism which uh, the NIA has, it is appreciated, and uh, I know you sometimes feel that you're in this sandwich in the middle between the government on the one hand and, well, after all, people that pay the wages of the executives and staff. I mean, that's the way these things work. But we do, we do really, really appreciate it. So um, uh, the, the sector deals, which Lord Hutton mentioned, are a major component of industrial strategy. And we published last Monday, well, we published the launch of um, our industrial strategy. Um, and the nuclear industry is very much part of it. There's a bit of a uh, sort of urban myth going around that, well, you're either in it or you're not. And if you weren't mentioned in the white paper, then it's not going to be. Well, this really isn't the case at all. The strategy is one of our top priorities, and it's, it's a moving feast. It sets out in practical terms how we intend to build Britain. I could, you, we know we're supposed to always use the catchphrases, fit for the future. I can't remember what the last one was, long-term economic plan, etc. All, all governments have them. But actually, it is, it's a way that we feel we are moulding, we're providing the cornerstones for the development of industry and business in the UK. Not picking winners and losers. I think that 
was in the 70s, it didn't particularly work very well. Not saying, well, actually, industrial strategy has nothing to do with us because we think the market will take care of everything. I hope self-evidently that's true and that's equally as discredited. And we think that by focusing on the five foundations of productivity, and it's all about productivity being reflected in cost savings or uh, new technologies, etc. Really, it's all about productivity. And, you know, my, um, my constituents don't stand around in pubs saying, oh, you know, I really like your industrial strategy, mate, or it's all about productivity. Of course they don't. But it is what brings prosperity to people by doing things more efficiently, by pushing costs down and pushing skills up. And it's not necessarily such a retail proposition. It's not the sort of thing... Well, my, uh, my friend and uh, boss, Greg Clark, he thinks, actually, because he does talk about it every evening at every social event and everything else because he believes in it very passionately, as we all do. But it's not... It, in political terms, I view it very much as a sort of government to business, government to industry, etc. <laughs> but I do think people it will make a fundamental difference to the prosperity of the country, which is what we're on it for. So our five foundations of productivity, ideas, people, infrastructure, business environment, and place, the idea that that's unlocked the potential to build prosperous currencies all the way across the UK, the place bit being particularly important, not just London and the South East. And of course, this industry particularly, that's a particular strength of nuclear industry, by definition. I mean, even with some of the uh, more advantageous uh, designs for future nuclear that we've seen, I don't think there's going to be one uh, in uh, Trafalgar Square. Although there's parts of this building that haven't been fully utilised, unlike this one. But uh, we've identified four grand challenges, areas where we can seize the initiative with the technologies and interests um, industries of tomorrow. And the area, obviously, that fits in here is clean, clean growth. <clears throat> and showing people, as, as the last few years has, that, that growth is not incompatible with building clean energy. In fact, clean energy provides and has proven to be a good source of prosperity, uh, employment, exports and innovation. And that's very much our pitch, and I think it's a real one, that we can... One of the things that we can do is, tr is lead the world in carbon um, free or low carbon technologies and industries. And as I've said, I think the nuclear industry is uniquely well placed to deliver against these important objectives, providing clean, reliable energy while growing the economy. The sector provides tens of thousands of highly skilled jobs, and Lord Hutton may compared it to aerospace in, in its magnitude, but again, the principle is there of these are jobs that are highly skilled jobs while still growing the economy. And geographically, as we know, it, it benefits diverse regions from Cumbria to Somerset, Wales, and even Oxfordshire. But if we look at Hinkley Point C, when complete, the plant will provide enough clean energy to meet 7% of the UK's electricity needs. But the project's already begun to benefit the Southwest regionally because it's home to 2,500 workers who are currently on site. And we've seen £450 million in contracts let to local businesses in the first year alone. And we want to build on the momentum created by Hinkley and to continue to work closely with EDF, CGN, Horizon and NewGen on their proposal for future plants. I really welcome the news that Toshiba selected a preferred bidder for the NewGen project, and I do look forward to working personally with KEPCO to discuss their plans. At the other end of the fuel cycle, we continue to lead the way in waste and decommissioning, and we're seeing the benefit of this at Sellafield. And today, our expertise across the nuclear sector is recognised throughout the world. But we have to use this as a springboard. And as the industrial strategy makes clear, we must build on the UK's strength to take advantage of the opportunities of the future. So I welcome today's publication from the Nuclear Industry Council, a proposal for a sector deal, which sets out a number of steps to deliver on that potential. <clears throat> Boosting the competitiveness of the sector by driving down costs and the decommissioning proposals which I heard in uh, what we call a challenge session, where I met with um, well, Lord Hutton, Tom Sampson over there, and other colleagues, we um, to have 
well, challenge, it's, it's precisely what it was. We had what I think in diplomatic terms they call full and frank discussions, but it was very impressive what we heard because <clears throat> it's all about driving down costs and we are, I look forward to working with industry over the coming weeks to explore the proposals in detail. But I'm pleased with the uh, progress of these discussions to date. And as co-chair of the Nuclear Industry Council, as Lord Hutton said, he's really the chair. I think I'm honorary co-chair. But anyway, I do let him do most of the talking. I've witnessed firsthand the determination shown by the industry's leaders to see it succeed. But from our side, the government is also committed to a thriving and innovative industry. So I'm pleased to announce a package of new measures to boost innovation and provide greater, greater clarity on our future plans. So today, uh, recognising the value industry place on policy certainty, and I realise uncertainty is the enemy of progress, and I think everyone, I see some nods in this room, and I perfectly understand the frustration of government and businesses is very apparent. But today we're launching a consultation on siting arrangements for large-scale new nuclear plants which begins the process towards designating a new national policy statement for conventional nuclear power stations, which will be de deployable between 2026 and 2035. The initial consultation sets out the proposed siting process and assessment criteria for sites potentially, superior, uh, potentially suitable for nuclear plants with single reactor capacity above one gigawatt. And having this new national policy statement in place will provide reassurance and certainty to developers into the 2030s. Looking further ahead, we recognise the need to implement a responsible long-term solution for the disposal of higher activity radioactive waste. That's why early in the new year, we'll be launching two consultations as part of the process to site a geological disposal facility for higher activity radioactive waste. We'll be consulting on a framework for future planning decisions and separately on our approach to working with local communities in the siting process. Internationally, it's been shown that willing host communities are central to successful sitings of these uh, GDFs, geographical disposal facilities, and strong, effective and lasting relationships built on mutual trust and a shared vision of the long-term economic benefits for the host community are key to successful delivery of a GDF. I believe the consultations will help reassure industry that investment in the supply chain, both in people and in capability, will pay dividends once we move into the delivery phase of this project. Again, it supports, coming back to the industrial strategy, it supports both <coughs> objectives. On our current estimates, at the peak of construction, the site will support up to 1,000 jobs, with an additional 1,000 in the supply chain. And when it's ready, the facility will sustain about 600 jobs a year for more than a century, while delivering a significant investment and in innovation to local communities. Another key point of our industrial strategy is a big commitment to supporting innovation with a pledge to raise R&D investment to 2.4% of GDP by 2027. It's only by innovating across the nuclear supply chain that we'll be able to maintain our competitiveness into the future. This means new approaches to nuclear technology that drives down costs and improves safety. And I know you'll be keen to maintain the place because we know that the UK has the potential to become a world leader in developing the next generation of nuclear technologies. Your appetite's clear. Industry has repeatedly called for clar clarity on the government's plans for emerging nuclear technologies. So today, I'm pleased to be able to set out the first steps in the way forward that we're proposing. We've spent the last 18 months working closely with you to understand the new technological developments and to assess their viability through the small modular reactor competition. That exercise is now closed, but it's really improved our own evidence base and helped shape our thinking in the future. Three requests came through. Firstly, that the industry wants better and earlier access to regulators. So, as announced in the Clean Growth Strategy, we're providing up to £7 million of funding to regulators to build the capacity and capability to assess and license small nuclear reactor designs. 
The funding will also provide support for pre-licensing engagement between vendors and regulators. And a successful first event took place in November with a focus on regulatory issues relating to smaller water-cooled reactors. The second is to help turn new developers' ideals into detailed designs. And to help deliver on this, over the next three years, we're providing £44 million in R&D funding to support Generation 4 advanced reactors. The third request was to create the right market conditions to enable developers to bring new reactors to market. A crucial element of this is demonstrating commercial viability, in particularly the ability of new designs and delivery mechanisms to attract investment and generate cost-competitive comp electricity. Smaller-scale designs using modular and other modern manufacturing techniques offer the possibility of achieving these aims, and I'm very grateful to those developers who've shared their financial estimates with us. But we need to go further, so I'm setting up an expert finance group to report to me by the spring, so not a long period of time, by the spring, on smaller scale designs, identifying the barriers to investment and how these might be overcome. And we'll also be considering what further steps we as government might take to support smaller reactor designs and maximising the benefits to the UK supply chain. And in the clean growth strategy, we confirmed 460 million of funding to support work in areas which would include future nuclear fuels, new nuclear manufacturing techniques, recycling and reprocessing, reprocessing and advanced reactor design. So as part of this, I'm very happy to announce that we will soon be launching the second phase of the nuclear innovation program which will include up to £8 million for work on modern safety and security methodologies and advanced fuel studies. We've also recently awarded contracts worth over £5 million for work on materials and manufacturing as part of the Small Business Research Initiative that we launched last year. And of course, I'm very happy we'll be working with AMEC Nuclear, AMLC, Fraser Nash Consultancy and the University of Sheffield on this work. Our leadership in nuclear technology is not just about progress in fission technology, and I want to see us maintain our global advantage in fusion technology. So I'm pleased to confirm that the £86 million worth of funding to establish the National Fusion Technology Platform, because our investment will support UK industry in targeting major contracts for nuclear fusion and build on our expertise in this potentially transformative field. And this builds on the pledge we made in June to underwrite our fair share of funding for JET until the end of 2020. These actions underline our commitment to close co collaboration with our European partners on nuclear research and training as we prepare to leave the EU and Euratom. And on Euratom itself, which has dominated a lot of my time over the last few weeks, we have been clear repeatedly that our decision to withdraw from the Euratom Treaty in no way diminishes our nuclear ambitions. The objective for our negotiations is to seek maximum continuity with Euratom across nuclear trade, research and regulation. And I'm very pleased to say that we're making good progress with our negotiations with the EU, with the IAEA and with our key trading partners across the globe. And I understand you'll be hearing later from David Wagstaff who I can't remember his formal title, but he's actually our lead negotiator in this. So, and he's, he and I have worked very closely together on the bill and on, well, we've been to select committees together. We've been through quite a few things to, and I'm pleased to say that the negotiations are progressing well. The first phase of the EU negotiations are focused on legal and technical issues relating to nuclear materials and safeguard arrangements. And in his report, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union, that's the department known as DEXEU, which has taken some of us some months to pronounce, let alone what they're actually doing. But um, <laughs> we know now. And he did say we are now close to reaching agreement on the vast majority of issues set out in our position papers on Euratom. And that is not from us, that's from DEXEU department. But we're very keen to continue this good progress by moving on as quickly as possible to the negotiations on the future relationship with Euratom, with the aim of maintaining the closest possible relationship. But I'm not naive, and I don't underestimate the challenges that we're facing. There are some areas, such as free movement of goods and services, which are linked to broader negotiations with the European Union. 
That's why we're putting the necessary arrangements in place to provide certainty for the nuclear industry that it will be able to continue successfully under any scenario. For example, negotiating bilateral safeguards agreements with the International Atomic Energy Agency, negotiating the bilateral nuclear cooperation agreements with Japan, Australia, US and Canada, delivering a new domestic nuclear safeguards regime, regime regulated by the ONR, and exceeding the standards that the international community would expect from the UK. Um, the bill itself, the Nuclear Safeguards Bill, which gives us the power to establish that, new, that domestic safeguards regime, I'd say, well, I think very good progress has been made. The bill passed the Commons Committee stage on the 14th of November um, after extensive hearings. Some experts in this room gave evidence to us, and uh, it's known in uh, Parliament as line-by-line -line scrutiny. And um, my shadow, Dr Alan Whitehead, known to some of you, believe me, he's very thorough on line-by-line -line scrutiny. Um, I mean that in a very complimentary way, and that, uh, absolutely. But it took several days, but um, with the right attitude from all of us and avoiding confrontation and finding ways to take each other's position into account, um, it passed the committee stage and um, hoping that we get a date for report stage very soon. We've also held many discussions with the sector to better understand your own concerns. Um, many of my colleagues, including myself, were in attendance at September's industry forum. But most importantly, we'll continue to engage closely with you in parallel with our discussions with the EU. And I can announce that we'll be holding further industry roundtables on a recurring basis. And uh, I think enough of that from me because we've got plenty of officials here. And as I say, I'm very pleased that you'll be hearing from David Wagstaff as well. And I've also got a team here from the Civil Nuclear Directorate in the event space to answer questions on any of today's announcements. So I believe that today's announcements and the progress we've made point to great opportunities in the nuclear industry. But I know we're not naive. We know the sector faces a big challenge to remain competitive going forward. And it's emphasized by the falling price of offshore wind. And that's good news for us from the clean growth agenda. And we're trying to avoid, as Lord Hutton said, this simplistic view. Well, as some people say, oh, well, it's, you know, great. With uh, the way the price of offshore wind has gone down, that means we're done bye-bye nuclear and bye-bye everything else. We know this is not the case. That's a very naive and very simplistic way of doing it. The government's policy is very much based on, well, um, I, I, you can call it mixed use. You can call it a variety of different energy sources. You can call it security, balance it, whatever the cliche that comes out of the cliche bag. But nuclear has got an important part to play as of the others. And um, the industry is very aware of what's needed. Um, there's more pressure going to come on nuclear from developments like battery storage. But I know that nuclear can compete. I know that nuclear will compete. And it's my job to make sure that government plays a key role in this. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.